strange that so many Christians should be celebrating the 3,000th anniversary of Jerusalem becoming the Jewish capital. But many people don't realize that the name Jerusalem occurs just as frequently in the New Testament as in the Old. In fact, it occurs 700 times in the Old Testament and about 100 times in the New. But when you consider the size of the Old Testament and the smaller size of the New, it's about the same ratio, about the same proportion. Jerusalem is of as much concern to Christians as it is to Jews. Furthermore, Christians don't just celebrate 3,000 years of Jerusalem this year, but 4,000 years of Jerusalem. Our celebration goes back way beyond the Jewish celebration. It goes back to the days of Abraham when he was returning from battle on the other side of the Jordan River with exhausted and hungry and thirsty troops. And a man came out of Jerusalem and gave them bread and wine. And Abraham gave a tenth of the spoil of battle to the man who gave them the bread and wine. His name was Melchizedek. And he was an unusual combination of a priest and a king. And that's exactly what Jerusalem needs. It doesn't just need a king, it needs a priest and a king. Someone who will not only rule the people in justice and wisdom, but somebody who will represent them before God and intercede for them before God. And Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the Christian celebration of Jerusalem goes back 4,000 years. The Jews are looking back to the day when it became the capital city which David established. And they look back on that day with longing. Now, Israel has been said to be a country that has too much history and too little geography. That's not a bad statement. If it's true of the land, it is also true of the capital. Jerusalem has too much history and too little geography. But I'm fascinated by the geography of Jerusalem. And while you've been hearing a lot about the history this week, I'd like to give you a little geography lesson. The first surprise I got when I went to Jerusalem in 1961 was that I didn't see it until I'd reached it. I had always thought Jerusalem must be right up on the top of the mountains and that you could see it from miles away. But when I got there, I didn't see it until we finally came over the little hill by the large concert hall, the Binyane Hauma, and there it lay before us. And I realized that Jerusalem, while it's up in the mountains, is not on the top of the mountains. One day it will be, according to the Bible, but it's not now. It's hidden in a hollow, surrounded by a circle of hills. Somebody has said, if you can imagine a nightlight in a sugar bowl, you've got the geography of Jerusalem. It's down in this hollow. And in fact, each facet of the octagonal dome of the rock faces one of the mountains around Jerusalem. There are eight in a circle. It means that the temple, when you worshipped in the temple, you could see both the mountains and the sky. Unlike the pagan high places, which were put on the top of a mountain and could only see the sky, worshippers of Yahweh could see the mountains and the sky because they were worshipping the maker of heaven and earth. That makes the geography of Jerusalem almost unique. There is something more that I discovered about the geography that surprised me. The city of David is outside the city walls, at least the present city walls, which are not all that old, built by Suleiman the Magnificent just a few hundred years ago. But the little city of David was a tiny, narrow ridge below the present city walls. And the other big surprise was that not only were there two valleys, one on either side of that little ridge, the Kidron Valley on the east, 
and what was later called the Tyropean Valley on the west. There was a third valley further to the west called the Valley of Hinnom. And that Valley of Hinnom came round the corner, many of you have seen this, and became very, very deep and joined the other two before it headed off toward the Dead Sea. Now try and imagine that picture. Here are three valleys running north and south which are joined along the bottom. That forms a Hebrew letter. The Hebrew letter Shin, which is the first initial of Shaddai, and incidentally also of Shabbat. And that letter Shin is the initial of the Almighty God. And it's in the geography of Jerusalem. He has written his name in the rocks. The three valleys together. If you go over to a little dish on the stand over there, you'll see that letter Shin. And then I want you to go to the model of Jerusalem at the back and you'll see how the letter Shin is carved out of the very geography of Jerusalem. For this city of Jerusalem should not be there. There is no reason to put a capital up in a hollow in the mountains where nobody can see it from a distance. It is not on the coast, it's not a port, it's not on a main river, it's not on a trade route, it's not on a main road, it's just nestling up in them their hills. The only reason why Jerusalem is there is God. It is essentially a religious city, and that's part of its fascination. But it's a city over which many people have wept. And one of my messages tonight is that Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem today. And I wonder how many of you are sharing his tears. King David wept over Jerusalem in exactly the same spot where Jesus himself wept over the city. And it was that same spot where I first wept over it. It was in 1961 and I walked down the hill from the Mount of Olives down to Gethsemane and then up in through the Lion's Gate. But as I came down I began to weep. It's the most beautiful city and the most tragic in the whole world. And it was that that made me weep. I found myself next to a little building which is shaped like a human tear, which has been built on the very place where both David and the son of David wept over this city. It's when you study the history of Jerusalem that you realize what a sad tale it is. I want to speak to you tonight about three things. Jerusalem has a past. Jerusalem has a present. But above all, Jerusalem has a future. Not only do the Christians go further back than Jews this year in thinking about Jerusalem, a thousand years further back, we also go a thousand years further ahead. We celebrate tonight 5,000 years of Jerusalem, a thousand years before David took it over, and a thousand years after the son of David will resume that throne. So we have a huge amount of ground to cover. The demonstration, the exhibition covers that 3,000 years, but I want to try and cover 5,000 years tonight. I'm not going to preach for a thousand years, but uh, please don't anybody sit on windowsills tonight because there was a man called Eutychus who fell out of a window when Paul went on after midnight. I promise you I won't go as far as midnight. Well, now this amazing city has been given in the Hebrew Scriptures 70 titles. It is the city of justice. It is the city of truth. It is the eternal city. And above all, its name means city of peace. Its original name, long before King David took it, was Salem, Salam, Shalom, 
peace. It's a lovely word, shalom. It means harmony with God, harmony with people, harmony with nature, and harmony with yourself. And that's a wonderful greeting to give people, shalom, those four harmonies. But alas, the sad truth is that Jerusalem's history has never been one of harmony. Somebody summed up its history in three words, bloodshed, brutality, and bickering. That's quite a summary of a city's history. And it's had more of that than any other city in the world. Seventeen times this city has been destroyed and rebuilt. It has been occupied by enemy forces more than any other city in the world. And there it is today, and still today. It is a city that lives in tension, that longs for peace, but doesn't have it. Well, now let's try and trace some of the three dimensions of history, of this Jerusalem of gold. The Jews call it that. Christian hymns call it Jerusalem the golden, largely because of the stone from which it's built. Like the Cotswold stone, it glows a beautiful gold in the setting sun. And anybody who has seen Jerusalem, either at sunrise or sunset, knows why it's called the city of gold. It has a fascination. The very name itself conjures up deep emotions in us. For Christians, that's where everything happened that means so much to us. That's where our salvation was wrought by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where he died. That's where he rose again. It is from there that he ascended and to that place that he will return. To the Jews it means history, nostalgia. For they look back to the first 70 years under David's occupation of that city as the golden age the age of empire. It had taken them 1,000 years from the individual man called Abraham to become the empire under David. The individual became a family. The family became a tribe. The tribe became a nation. And the nation became an empire. And at last, after a 1,000 years, they had all the land that God promised to them. The sad story is that it only took another 500 years to lose all of it. A thousand years to get it, five hundred years to lose it. And the turning point came on one tragic afternoon when a king who should have been leading his army in war decided to stay home and saw a naked lady next door and in one afternoon broke five out of the Ten Commandments. That is when Israel's fortunes turned. And after that it was downhill all the way. David's family was the first to be affected by the consequences, but within a few generations the whole country was in civil war and divided never to be united again. Jews are still very divided. Did you know how many political parties were trying to get a few of the hundred seats in the Knesset last week? There are 64 political parties in Israel today. They have proverbs like two Jews, three opinions. They are still profoundly divided. Jerusalem is not the city of peace. It was only that city of peace very briefly under David and Solomon, but Solomon sowed the seeds of discontent and David's grandson Rehoboam, through sheer folly, wrecked the unity of the nation. Well, now Jerusalem, therefore, is a city with a past and they lost it all. Only 50,000 of them came back from exile in Babylon and they struggled to rebuild temple and city, but never achieved more than a pale reflection of what it had been. Most of the Jews stayed in Babylon for business reasons. And yet some of those who stayed in the east 
watch the sky in the west for a star. They knew that Balaam had prophesied that a star would arise in Judah. And when they saw that star, they set off for Bethlehem. The wise men who came to Bethlehem were Jews, not Gentiles. They had stayed in Babylon. But when the king was born, they came. Those few who'd come back never had political freedom again. They were under the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans. One enemy after another occupied that little land. They longed for the days of David again. I remember hearing from Leonard Pearson, who many of you will know and whose models are on demonstration at the back, how a Jewish father who had just had a son by his wife would rush into the street and shout, Dawid, Dawid, David, David. It was his way of announcing that a boy had been born. But why would he use the name David every time? The answer is, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah? And for 400 years, while occupied by one enemy after another, God said and did nothing. Not a single prophecy, not a single miracle for four whole centuries. And during that time, they longed for a king to be born, for a son of David to come. And he came. But far from their dreams and hopes being realized, it all went terribly wrong. And in the year AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed yet again. Something like 400 Jews every day were crucified when Titus invaded Jerusalem. A total of 300,000 were nailed to crosses. A million died. And there began 2,000 years of very sad history for this city. I know you've heard some of this, but I just want to pick up all these threads. There came the day, 135 AD, when Jews were forbidden even to live within a certain distance of their capital city. And it was renamed Aeolia Capitolina. The name Jerusalem might have disappeared forever from history, but it didn't. The name has hung on to this day and is the capital of Israel again. But through the last 2,000 years, it has been occupied by so many different people. It was occupied by Christians first, Byzantine Christians from Constantinople. Then it was occupied by Arabs. Then by Turks, by the Seljuks and the Mamluks. And on and on it went. And finally the British occupied that city. To our shame. For we had made quite incompatible promises to both Arabs and Jews. Most of you have heard of Lawrence of Arabia, but have you heard of Lawrence of Israel? For there were two Lawrences. They were brothers. And Winston Churchill sent one of those brothers to help the Jews fight for freedom. The other Lawrence helped the Arabs. But you've only heard of the one, haven't you? Incidentally, Winston Churchill was one of the strongest friends of Israel until 1945, when he wrote a dreadful letter to Chaim Weizmann and said, I want nothing more to do with you Jews. Two weeks later, Winston Churchill had disappeared from politics. He is one of six prime ministers during my lifetime who have disappeared when they broke a promise to God's chosen people. And so this sad history of the past of Jerusalem, the more you study it, the more you weep over it, the sadder the story becomes. You can only look back to the first 70 years of the 3,000 as a time when Jerusalem was peaceful and prosperous, happy and healthy. But for the rest of the three millennium, it has been a sad, sad city. That's Jerusalem and its past. I've rushed through it because 
I want to get on to Jerusalem and its present. I mean by its present, the 20th century. It began really three years before the, the turn of the century in 1897 when Theodor Herzl announced that prophetic word in the casino in Basel in Switzerland that maybe not in 10 or 20 or 30 years, but in 50 years, there would be a state of Israel on the map again. He was two months out. But what many people have not realized is that behind Theodor Herzl's dream of Zionism lay an Englishman, an Anglican clergyman who was chaplain to the British Embassy in Vienna and who believed the promises of God that one day Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel again. And it was that Anglican chaplain who planted in Theodor Herzl, an agnostic journalist, the dream of Zionism. And he went to Germany where most of the Jews in Europe lived, as well as Poland, but he went to the German Jews and he begged them to go back to their land. And he said, let us hold a Zionist Congress here in Germany, in Munich, in Munich, to persuade the German Jews to go back to their own land. And do you know what their response was? We don't want to know. We are Germans now. We are more German than Jewish. We have assimilated. We are accepted. This is our home. We are happy here. We are going to stay in Germany. And they would not let Theodor Herzl hold that Congress in Munich. And he had to move the whole idea to Basel in Switzerland. I believe that if the Jewish people of Germany had listened to God's voice through that man via that Anglican clergyman, they would have escaped the Holocaust. Those who say, where was God during the dreadful years when Jews were put in the gas ovens? I have stood in the cremation chamber of Auschwitz. I've stood in the room where they were gassed and seen the marks of their fingernails on the wall as they tried to escape the deadly Zyklon B gas. Where was God, they say. God had told them half a century before, go back to your land, and they didn't want to know. How important it is that people listen to God and obey him before it is too late. But that's when the modern history of Jerusalem began. Already Jews were moving there with the help of Baron Rothschild and others, they were forming little colonies. They were reclaiming swampland, facing malaria. They were going back, but they were still under the Turks. The German Kaiser, who was an ally of the Turks, decided to visit Jerusalem. And for his visit, they pulled down a section of wall, the width of this uh, center portion of this church, so that he could ride in triumph on his horse through the gap. The gap is next door to the Jaffa Gate. There is a road through the gap now, but it was pulled down for the German Kaiser to come through on his horse. Not many years later, a Christian soldier of the British Army, General Allenby, with a New Testament in his tunic pocket, walked through the Jaffa Gate bareheaded. He said, I cannot ride when Jesus rode. And so from then on, the British were given custody through the mandate of this city. The tragedy is by 1947, we were sick of it. We washed our hands of it. And I believe one of the direct results was that the British Empire was taken away from us. God was saying as clearly as he could, if you cannot look after my people, you cannot look after anybody. And within five years, the red of the British Empire, which had stretched across my school atlas of the world, the empire on which the sun never set, had disappeared. For it is God who draws the boundaries in time and space of nations. 
Well, there were uh, incompatible promises, some to the Arabs, some to the Jews, which to this day has borne bitter fruit in the Arab-Israeli conflict. When I first went to Jerusalem in 1961, it was more divided than Berlin. I remember having to carry my bags through the Mandelbaum Gate, that checkpoint Charlie which divided Arab Jerusalem from Israeli. And between the two there were minefields. I remember the Baptist minister from Jerusalem, Bob Thompson, coming to stay with us. And I went to take him a cup of tea in the morning and fell over his wooden leg which was on the floor and spilled the tea all over him. He lost his leg rescuing a child from the minefields. Little boy had wandered in. The Baptist pastor risked his life for that little boy. Lost his leg. That was Jerusalem in 61. As sad as Berlin until the last few years. Now it's one city. I was there at the end of the Six Day War. And I remember one extraordinary day when we set off to walk, no, in fact, to bus from West Jerusalem to East over the minefield, which had now been cleared. But it was simply a barren patch. The barbed wire had gone, but it was just bare soil. And the bus drove through this barren strip to the Arab side. We, we looked around the old city and we came back in the evening. And when we came back in the evening, there was a tarmac road with concrete pavements and street lamps lit. And we said, where did the minefield go? The city was reunited in days because the United Nations were coming to inspect it. And when they arrived, they couldn't find out where it had been divided. For the Jewish people had simply brought it together some years later, declaring it to be the everlasting capital of Israel, which has stuck in the Arab throat ever since. Jerusalem has a present and that present we are very much aware of. It has played a unique role in the recent election. Netanyahu, Yahu is God's name, Bibi as they call him, accused Shimon Peres of being willing to let Jerusalem be divided again and to let the old city go back to the Arabs. Whether that was an accurate accusation or not may be debatable, but it played a role. And now we see Israel divided equally down the middle, undecided whether to trust a man who will make treaties with her enemies or to trust a man who will be tough, and they have been 50-50 divided. The tragedy, of course, is this that they are looking to men to get them out of their trouble. And they don't know which kind of men to look to. That is the big mistake. For one of the biggest shocks you get when you go to that holy city is to find out that it's not a holy city, except in your imagination. That the people there are as secular as they are here. That the same proportion of the population attend synagogue as attend church. I'll never forget, I had a half-hour audience with the president of Israel in his palace. And he told me, frankly, that he was agnostic. He did not know whether there was a God or not. I could have wept. The president of God's chosen people doesn't know whether there's a God. I said, but this is where God did his miracles, this very city. And he said, he's not doing them now. This was President Navon. And the two men who've been fighting to be the prime minister, neither of them is a believer. And that is the tragedy of Jerusalem. It's part of their future that there will come a day when they have no one else to turn to but the God who brought them out of Egypt. That day is predicted in the prophecies of both Old and New Testament but it hasn't come yet. 
There are many things to happen before it does. There are still two mosques on the temple foundations. One over the very place where Abraham offered Isaac, Mount Maria, and the other over the very place where the Holy Spirit came on 120 people on the day of Pentecost. If ever you go to the mosque, Al-Aqsa, that marks the site of Solomon's porch, which is where they, the first disciples used to meet for prayer at 9 o'clock in the morning. That was the house where the Holy Spirit fell. It wasn't a private upper room. It was the temple house of God where the Holy Spirit came. But they are two mosques. And Jerusalem is still divided between the Jewish, the Christian, and the Muslim religion. And the Christians are divided into 36 denominations and have a dreadful history of division, particularly between the Western and the Eastern churches. And as you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has been such a subject of argument and is occupied by at least five different groups calling themselves Christians who have been so at each other's throats that they have to have a Muslim doorkeeper to look after the key for them. It is a sad city. It's not the city of peace, though people have prayed for the peace of Jerusalem for centuries. That prayer has not yet been answered, but it will be one day. But as long as it remains a secular city, it will not be. Now let me move to my main subject tonight, Jerusalem and its future. I am not going to be a political speculating person who tries to extrapolate the present trends into the future and guess what's going to happen in the next few years. I've lived long enough to know that politics is full of surprises. Who would ever have guessed that Yitzhak Rabin would be assassinated by a Jew? It was totally unexpected. And the events of the next few years are likely to be very surprising. So I'm not going to try and speculate the present trends certainly are disturbing, especially with fundamentalist fanatics on both sides of the Great Divide. The spread of atomic weapons is another factor which I believe will be visible there in the Middle East. Israel already has atomic weapons, but they are going to proliferate, especially from Russia. You can almost buy one secondhand now. And when some of the other countries are able to have atomic weapons, what is going to happen? There is much talk of internationalizing Jerusalem. Amazingly, the Jewish people accepted that way back in 1948, when the United Nations wanted to divide the Promised Land between Arab and Jew and make Jerusalem an international city, not a Jewish city, an international one. The Jews accepted that, but the Arabs would not. There is a revived talk of this from a number of different quarters that Jerusalem should become a United Nations city, an internationalized zone. And yet the Jews have said it is our capital forever. One thing I can predict about the future, and that is that Jerusalem is going to be the very focus, the very heart, the very neuralgic point of the whole Arab-Israeli conflict. I will tell you now that if the whole land of Israel was given to the Arabs, but Jerusalem kept, the conflict would continue. That is the heart. The Old Testament calls Jerusalem a rock of offense to the nations. And so it will prove to be. But I'm not going to try and speculate I want to give you certain hopes for the future of Jerusalem because we have them. The Bible is an astonishing book. It is crammed with predictions about the future. I don't know why people read their horoscopes. Those six men and seven women out of every ten in this country read their stars every day. Horoscopes and other clairvoyant methods of finding out the future are never more than 5% correct, which in my book means they are always 95% wrong. 
so why do people read them? Then there is the scientific, as opposed to the superstitious way of finding out about the future. And there are now professors of futurology and think tanks. And the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston has already worked out the date of the end of the world. It's 2040, if you're interested. Doesn't affect me particularly, but it might affect some of you. They have worked out the population growth, the resources of food and fresh water, the resources of fossil fuel and so on, and they say, unless we can change some of these things, then human life will become impossible on Earth by 2040. As we go into the 21st century, there is a different mood as we came into the 20th century, the word on everybody's lips was progress. But as we get into the 21st century, the word on everybody's lips is survival. We don't even know if we'll have another hundred years, never mind another thousand. That's how people are talking. That's the mood. Gloom and doom. How long can the environment take it and go on supporting us? That's where we are now. And yet the Bible predicts at least another thousand years for the city of Jerusalem, the present city. So somebody's got it wrong. Now I want to look into the Bible because when you take the scripture way of looking at the future, you come across some remarkable statistics. I know there are three kinds of lies, black, white, and statistics. And it was an ancestor of my mother, Sir John Sinclair, who invented the word statistics. Horrible word. He must have had his own teeth when he said it. <laughs> but I want to give you some statistics. Within the pages of my Bible, there are 735 separate predictions about the future. Some of them are only mentioned once. One is mentioned 300 times. I'll come to that one later. But 735 predictions. And of those, 596 have already come true. Literally true. 596. Uh, for mathematicians, that's just over 81% have already come true, then I'm prepared to believe the rest. I have no difficulty believing that what God has promised about the future will happen as certainly as 81% of his predictions have already come true, literally, in history. You know some of them so well that his son would be born in Bethlehem. It took a poll tax to achieve that. Don't ever grumble about poll taxes because it ensured that Jesus was born in the right place. Predicted that he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Those are just two out of 596 which have already come true. Now many of the other 20% are about the end of the world so we wouldn't have expected them to come true yet because we're still here. But many of them are about this very city of Jerusalem and about its last thousand years within this age. Therefore, I can tell you now, this world will be here at least until the year 3000 AD. It is written in God's word. But we're considering the future of Jerusalem tonight. There are many things I want to say about it, but a good starting point would be to read just one of those prophecies about her. And since it's probably the most important, God gave it to us twice, word for word, through two different prophets. It's one of the very few prophecies that occurs twice in our Bible, word for word, under different names. And the two names are Isaiah and Micah. And I'm sure if you know your Bible, you know I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 2, 
which is the same as Micah chapter 4. Now, who got it from whom? Or whether they both got it direct from the Lord, we do not know. But out of the mouth of two witnesses, says the law of Moses, truth is established. And so here we have truth. Let me read it to you. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and settle disputes among the peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Some years ago, I was in New York and had a few hours to spare. I went to the United Nations headquarters on the side of the Brooklyn River and joined an official tour of the building. And a smart young girl in uniform showed us the General Assembly Room, the Security Council Room, the Committee Rooms, many marvelous works of art. One thing I'd been interested in before I got to the building was outside the front door is a massive lump of granite, and on it is inscribed half a verse of Scripture. I'm always worried when people quote half a verse. And the half was, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But I thought that's only half the verse. The other half is that the Lord will reign in Zion and he will settle the disputes among the nations. You can't have one half of the verse without the other. But we went round the building and after a couple of hours the young girl said, well, that's the end of our tour. Have a nice day. And I said, but you haven't shown us one room. She said, what room is that? And I told her, oh, she said, that's not open to the public. But I said, I want to see that room. I've heard about it. Please, can I see it? No, she said, it's, it's closed to the public. And then I tried the usual, uh, I don't know what to call it, you know, put on a spaniel look and say, I've come all the way from little old England. <laughs> I pleaded hard, but she finally said, well, you can go and ask the guards at the reception. So I went to the reception foyer, and here were some armed soldiers. I went to one of them and said, I wonder if you could uh, let me see uh, one of the rooms in this building. He said, which room? I told him. He said, no, no, that's closed, that's locked. I said, but I really want to see it. I've come a long way, and I really want to see that room. He said, how long would you want to be in there? I said, not more than two minutes. I've just heard about it, and I want to see it. He said, all right, then, and he leaned across the counter, took a key off a hook, and took me to a room. It's a small triangular room, squeezed between two wings of the building. has no windows, very dark and gloomy. There's just a little bit of light filters around the edge of the ceiling. It's the prayer room of the United Nations. And there are stools and prayer mats for you to pray, and in the center of the room is the God to whom you pray. Cast iron, the size and shape of a coffin, painted matte black. I'd heard this and I couldn't believe it, but I've seen it with my own eyes. How did it get there? 
Well, when the first Secretary General of the United Nations went round the building, he said, but we don't have a prayer room where people can pray for peace. And so they built this little room between the two wings. And then came the biggest debate that the United Nations have, has ever had. What to put in the room? Some wanted a cross, but no, that was not acceptable to others. Some wanted flowers. The Hindus wanted flowers, but that was not acceptable to the Muslims. And so they debated. And finally, they commissioned an artist, a sculptor, to create a god that would appeal to everybody. And he created this block of cast iron, painted matte black, so that when you kneel down and pray to it, you can sort of look right into it, and you can imagine your own God in there. I've seen it with my own eyes. When I came away, I thought, first, they've built this building in the wrong place. It's in New York. But it's in Zion that the disputes of the nations will be settled praying to the wrong God. They're praying to a block of cast iron. Not surprisingly, the room is usually locked and very few people go there. But here is a prediction that one day Jerusalem will be the headquarters of the United Nations and disputes among the nations will be taken there and will be settled with such perfect justice that the nations will not even think of going to war and multilateral disarmament can take place and the money being spent on guns and tanks can be spent on food and clothes. Is that a dream? Well, that depends on what you make of prophecies like this. I believe it's going to come true. It's part of the next thousand years for Jerusalem. The prophecy in Isaiah 2, which we were just considering, is one of many, many predictions in the Old Testament about a dream for the future. There are many aspects of that dream. There is, as I've already said, worldwide peace, because there will be justice. We cannot have peace without justice. I'm afraid the world at the moment is in a mood of peace at any price. But lasting peace depends on just settlements of disputes. And only when we have the wisdom and the understanding of God in a man will we be able to take our disputes and have them properly settled. But there are many other aspects. We have pictures in the Old Testament of a world in which health has been so improved that people dying at a hundred years of age will be regarded as tragically premature. We have a picture of old men and young children safely walking and playing in the streets. We have a picture of even nature being transformed, carnivores becoming herbivores, the wolf and the lamb lying down together and the lion eating straw like the ox and children playing with poisonous snakes without harm. No hurting or harming in all God's world. Is this an impossible dream? Now when you put all these little bits of the jigsaw together, a wonderful picture emerges of a golden age which everybody longs to see, but nobody hopes to see or expects to see. The Jews call it the Messianic Age. And there are many debates among Jewish scholars as to how long this Messianic Age will last when the Messiah comes and takes over the throne of David and rules not only the nation Israel, but the whole world. The nations come under his guidance and wisdom. How long will it last? Well, some scholars have thought 40 years and some a hundred and some even have thought a thousand. Those of us who know the New Testament and believe it know that the thousand is the right figure. Six times in Revelation 20 we are told that Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. 
I find that though most Christians believe Jesus is coming back, very few have ever asked why, and very few have asked how long will he stay, and what is he going to do that he did not achieve or accomplish the first time. And most Christians I talk to have no idea that they are coming back with him to live a second time on planet Earth. I'm not talking about reincarnation. I'm talking about resurrection. Because we're all going to get new bodies, but we don't get them in heaven. You don't need a body in heaven. But you do need one if you're going to live down here. And this is exactly where you will get your new body. We know that God will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. I've spoken at uh, three funerals in the last year or two. My mother-in-law who died at 98, my daughter who died at 36, and my brother-in-law a few weeks ago after a very brief illness uh, died at 67. At each of these funerals, I didn't want to talk much about the past. I talked quite a bit about the present and where they are now and who they're with and what they're doing, but my main subject was they are all coming back to live here. And I could see that even Christians seemed surprised. Why should Christ have to come back here and why should we all need to be back here? The answer is because we are going to be the government of the world. We're going to reign with Christ over the nations. It will not be a democratic government, but a rod of iron government. That doesn't mean cruelty, it just means non-elected. No choice. And we are preparing now for this messianic age to which Jews and Christians should be looking forward together because we share for the hope in common. Now, all these wonderful promises about the future, unfortunately, have been dealt with in the Christian church in different ways. There are three different methods of handling these Old Testament prophecies. And you'll find, I'm afraid, that in the majority of churches in this country, they are handled in the wrong way. Which is why what I'm saying tonight, maybe the first time, You've heard these things in a Christian pulpit. One way is to treat all these ancient promises of the prophets as conditional, as having a big if, and therefore things that may come true, but if the conditions are not fulfilled, will not happen. And many believe that Israel has forfeited these promises and that they will never happen now. The big if has happened and therefore the conditions have not been fulfilled at the human level. Therefore there will not come a day when they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's the conditional interpretation of these wonderful prophecies. The second is more subtle. That is the spiritual way of interpreting them and applying them not to Israel but to the church. We call this replacement theology. And it is probably the majority view in the churches of this country that these promises made to Israel no longer apply to them, but apply to the new Israel, as many call the church. Actually, the word Israel is used 74 times in the New Testament, never of the church. We are not the new Israel according to the New Testament. But that is how many times the church is described. And therefore the promises to old Israel are applied to the church, but of course to do that you have to spiritualize them. You have to allegorize them. You have to say that the desert shall blossom as the rose in your heart. Well, there are no roses in my heart at the moment. There wasn't a desert before. But you know what I mean. You spiritualize it and apply it to Christians. That's the second way. The third way is to believe that these promises will be fulfilled and that God has a future for Israel, that he has not rejected those who have rejected him. When Paul, writing the New Testament, asks the rhetorical question, 
because the Jews rejected God and his son, has he rejected them? Never! The Greek is meganoita, which means never let it be. And so I am taking these promises, as many Christians do, in their literal, simplest, plainest sense, which is a good guide to interpreting Scripture. Scripture was not written for theological professors. It was written for ordinary folk like you and me. When you read Scripture with an open mind and heart and take it in its plainest, simplest sense, it becomes a very much more wonderful book. So when I read these promises, I believe there will be a messianic age in which these wonderful things will come true. However, there is another side to these predictions. There are not only good things promised for Jerusalem, there are bad things promised for Jerusalem as well. The suffering of Jerusalem is far from over. Many would like to believe that there is only one appropriate response to Israel today, and that is, comfort, comfort my people. But that is not the only response. Warn my people is just as necessary. I was once asked to speak outside the Yad Vashem, that dreadful museum of the Holocaust on Mount Herzl. And there was a large company of many hundreds of Jewish people and Christians, it was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we were allowed to hold a public meeting right outside that dreadful place. A rabbi began the meeting with a lament which tore our hearts in two. The lament for the six million, including one and a half million children. One of the most poignant exhibits in that museum is the last one as you come out, a glass case with a child's shoe. And that's all. And the figure one and a half million on the glass. And I got up and among other things I said, Israel wants the world's sympathy for the one and a half million children who perished in the Holocaust. But since you had your freedom you have destroyed one and a half million of your own offspring through abortion. There is something not quite right here. To be a friend of Israel is not to approve of everything Israel does. It is to be discriminating. It is important that we have a balanced view, that we don't give in to sentimental affection because scripture has predicted some very severe suffering for Jerusalem in the future. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. The prophet Zechariah predicts dreadful things, a city under siege, children killed, women raped, a third of the population of Jerusalem taken away. And this has not happened yet. It is still future. The hope of many Jews and not a few Christians is that Israel's troubles are over and that all that we should do now is comfort them. That is not the truth. Some of Israel's greatest troubles are yet to come. Now this is a strange message not often heard in Christian meetings called to think about Israel and the Jewish people. I had a letter this morning from a Jew who believes in Jesus and he said when will Christian preachers tell the truth that Jerusalem is yet to suffer horribly. His name was Art Katz and I think some of you must know I wrote a letter back to him this afternoon and said I'm going to tell them this evening. You see, you can't pick and choose. If you're going to take all the predictions about Israel and its future in the Bible, then there is bad news as well as good news. It is a real mixture. Funnily enough, those who adopt replacement theology and apply the prophecies of the prophets to the church 
are very selective. They select all the nice ones, all the promises of blessing on Zion and grab them for the church, but they reject all the promises of suffering. They want the blessing but not the curse. If you have an old King James Bible, look at the prophet Isaiah and you'll find that each paragraph has a heading. And you'll find if it's a bad news paragraph, the heading is curses on Israel. If it's a good news paragraph, blessings on the church. How prejudiced can you be? But if we believe they will literally be fulfilled in Israel, then we have to be honest and say, Israel has yet to suffer. Indeed, the picture seems to be that only when Israel is back to the wall with no other nation supporting them and suffering so terribly that at last a spirit of intercession will sweep through the nation and they will cry on Yahweh. That's the picture. So that far from being, let's rejoice for Jerusalem, that the Jews have it back, we should be, I think, saying let's weep for Jerusalem because they're not yet crying on the Lord. They're not yet desperate enough. They can elect presidents and prime ministers who don't even believe in God. Now this mixture of good news and bad news, how do we fit it together? You see, the prophecies of the Old Testament, according to the New Testament, were given in bits and pieces. It's like opening a jigsaw with all the different pieces. We'll say, in this case, red pieces and green pieces. Good pieces, bad pieces. And it's difficult to fit them together if you only have the Old Testament. God spoke through the prophets, says Hebrews 1, in bits and pieces. But now he has spoken as a whole picture through his son. Now, I love jigsaw puzzles, but I always cheat. I prop up the picture on the lid and then move a piece around the picture until I find where it goes. That's cheating. You should never do that. Jigsaw clubs send you a box with no picture on the lid and you must fit it together yourself. That's the real way to do it. That's what you've got to do with the Old Testament if that's all you have. And it's one reason why the Jews didn't recognize Jesus, that they couldn't fit the bits together properly. And he didn't fit the picture. Nevertheless, he does fit the picture, but half that picture is seen in his first coming and half is seen in his second coming. That's what threw the Jewish people. They expected him to do everything on his first visit. But he will complete everything by his second. Now that's the picture that I'm going to draw for you now, particularly in relation to Jerusalem. Now how do we fit the bad news and the good news together? The bad predictions of more suffering for Jerusalem and the good predictions. In one case, it says God will bring all the nations against Jerusalem to attack Jerusalem. In the other picture it says God will bring all nations to Jerusalem to find peace, not to make war. Now these seem to be contradictory. How do we fit them together? Will it be a kind of alternately good news and bad news, good news and bad news, better news and worse news? That's what seems to be happening at the moment, but that's not the answer. The answer is to understand the biblical philosophy of history. Now, for just three minutes, I'm going to give you a lesson in philosophy of history. If you find it a bit hard, forget it and come back in just three minutes. But there are at least five different philosophies of history which are competing for our thinking. One is the cyclic view of history, which says history repeats itself. It simply goes round in circles what has happened before will happen again. There is nothing new under the sun. And we just go round and round on a roundabout. And we get off where we got on. But history is going round in circles. That is the Greek view of history. And because our philosophy owes more to the Greeks than the Hebrews, that's usually the way we talk. Well, history repeats itself. Then there is what's called the rhythmic philosophy of history. And that is that history goes up and down and up and down and up and down. It doesn't repeat itself. Each up is different from the previous ones. Each down is different. But the up and down pattern, inflation, recession, 
up and down, boom and bust. That's a very common view of history. And of course, therefore, you don't know whether history will end on an upper or a downer. Then there is the optimistic view of history. That's the view that captured the mind of our people at the beginning of the 20th century. And that view is that history is on the up and up and up. In fact, an English prime minister in the beginning of the 20th century, his slogan for the election was up and up and up and on and on and on. That's better than back to basics anyway, but that was his slogan. <laughs> That's the optimistic view of history. Very few hold that. Then there is the pessimistic philosophy of history that says history is simply going downhill and it's getting worse and things are far worse now than they were in my day. And the stairs are getting steeper these days and the, the print is getting smaller and everything's getting worse and wor mainly older people have this view. None of those views is the Bible view of history. The biblical philosophy of history is what we call the apocalyptic view. And if I draw a diagram for you, the cyclic view is that, the rhythmic view is that, the optimistic view is that, and the pessimistic view is that, but the apocalyptic view is this. In other words, the apocalyptic view says things will get much worse before they get better, but they will get much better after they get worse. That's the apocalyptic view, that the bad times precede the good times. And that view of history is shared by three groups of people, Jews, communists, and Christians. And they all three got it from the same place. They got it from the Hebrew prophets. And that is my view of the future. I believe things are going to get worse and then suddenly much better. The difference between those three views is what will make the difference? What will be the hinge of history? What will turn the tide of world events? The Jew tends to say God will. He will intervene. The communist says man will. He must bring about the revolution beyond which there will be a crimeless and placid society. The Christian says the return of Jesus will be the hinge of history. Things will get worse and worse until Jesus gets back. Then the world will be transformed and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's our philosophy of history. And that philosophy of history applies to the city of Jerusalem. Things will get much worse until the Messiah, whom we know is called Jesus, comes and then Jerusalem's day will begin and then you can fit all these prophecies in the time of Jacob's trouble must come before Jesus return this invasion by a United Nations army must come before afterwards the nations will come for peace not to make war that fits Jerusalem into our belief in the future reign of the Messiah, shared by Jews and Christians. Remember, of course, that Jerusalem is only a few miles south of Armageddon, and that is the obvious place for a huge army to gather, that triangular plain of Israel on the valley of Jezreel. That's the obvious place for a large army to gather before marching on the city of God. And that, of course, is where the last battle but one of history will take place. Why a huge army when it only needed a few soldiers to arrest Jesus when he came the first time? The answer is that by this time Jesus will be joined in Jerusalem by millions of his followers. You looking forward to your free flight to the Holy Land? We're all going to be there. It's the biggest meeting that Christians will ever have been to. There will be no stadium on earth big enough for it, so we're meeting him in the air what my Bible says. On my grandfather's tomb stone in Newcastle on Tyne, there are three words. They're not out of the Bible. They're from an old Methodist hymn I discovered. There is his name, David Ledger Porson. And underneath it says, what a meeting! What a meeting! <laughs> We're, we've almost got fed up with meetings down here, but what a meeting that will be. 
that will turn the tide for Jerusalem because it says that not only will millions of Gentiles be there but the Jewish people will look on him whom they pierced and weep and mourn as for an only son. I can only imagine the sheer grief of Jewish people when they realize that for 2,000 years they missed the Messiah. But oh, what a difference that will make when all Israel will be saved. So Jew and Gentile together, one flock under one shepherd, taking over the world government. What a picture. The mind boggles. But then the only thing a Jew needs to become a believer in Jesus is to discover that Jesus is alive. That's all. That was enough for Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road. I was preaching in Ely in Cambridgeshire and there was a 25-year-old Jewish young lady listening and afterwards she came to me. She said, were you trying to say that Jesus of Nazareth is still alive? I said, yes, I'm saying that. She said, then he must be our Messiah. Our. I like it. And then, do you know, she said, how could I find out if he's alive? I said, you could try talking to him. Ten minutes later, she was teaching me the Bible. She'd got it all. But the one key to unlock these prophecies was missing. And as soon as she found out that Jesus talked to her, that was enough. And she was taking me through these prophecies and saying, then this and this and this. I thought, well, I never saw that. How come I've been studying the Bible years and I never saw it? Oh, I envy Jewish people. They've got it all, except for the one thing that makes sense of the whole picture. But suddenly these pieces of the jigsaw fall into place. And now we see a messianic age when the Lord does reign in Zion and the nations come not in war anymore but in peace and to settle their disputes and to disarm. Well, that's my understanding of the next thousand years of the city of Jerusalem. That thousand years may not start immediately. I hope it'll be soon. I look forward to that. I'm not really bothered if I'm still alive or die first. Either way, I win. If I'm still around when Jesus returns, hallelujah, nobody will have to arrange the funeral. Nobody will measure me up for a box. I'll suddenly find I'm 33 again because I'm promised a body just like his glorious body. And when you're an old age pensioner like me, you can't wait to be 33 again. But even if I die, I still win because I get a front seat at the meeting. It says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive catch them up. So you win either way. But the important thing is we're talking about this earth. I find that Christians are very divided over their hopes for this world. And I'm afraid ever since Augustine messed it all up in the fifth century, Christians have centered their hopes on heaven rather than earth and on another world rather than this one. That is tragic. And the jibe that we are so heavenly minded were no earthly use has enough truth in it to stick. We have a hope for this world. But I find Christians divide into three neat categories. The pessimists, the optimists and the realists. I wonder which you are. Start with the pessimists. I'm caricaturing so that you can see them clearly. Pessimists are mainly older people, often in very small churches. And they say something like this, we're in the last days. There's going to be a great falling away. I'm not sure that there'll be many of us when Jesus gets back. Perhaps only you and me. And I'm not sure if you're sound either. Now, you've heard people talk like this. They're pessimists, mainly older folk. Then at the opposite extreme of the optimists, mainly young people, we're marching for Jesus. We're going to take over the world for Jesus. We're going to rule the nations now. We're going to drive the devil through the Channel Tunnel to France. But we're going to clean up. We're, we're going to clean up England. We're marching. We're on the winning side. There's an awful lot of that kind of optimism around, which is going to be disillusioned because things are going to get much worse before they get better. There's an antichrist coming to Jerusalem and that'll affect the world. There has been already such a person in 175 BC 
a man called Antioch Epiphanes came to the city of Jerusalem and did terrible things. He brought pigs into the temple and sacrificed them on the altar of God. He filled the temple with prostitutes. He forbade obedience to the Lord Moses. He was the worst man who ever entered Jerusalem. And the prophet Daniel said there'll be another such person before the end of history. And Jesus himself endorsed that. You read Matthew 24, where Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, a phrase that occurred three times in Daniel, which Jesus endorsed. Indeed, he said, you can read about it in Daniel. He said, when you see that, that's the third sign of my coming. The ultimate blasphemy will be a man who sets himself up in the very place where God set his name and will say, I am God. Antichrist must appear before the Christ can come. But we look beyond that. We look forward to the Messianic age when Jew and Gentile together become the world government under our Lord Jesus Messiah. That's the center of my hope. I'm a realist. I'm neither a pessimist nor an optimist. The pessimist says the world's just getting worse and worse and all we can do is save a few people from the Titanic before it goes down. The optimist says the church is going to take the world over and rule the world in the name of Jesus. The realist says the wheat and the tares will grow together. The kingdom of God will get stronger and the kingdom of Satan will get stronger. And therefore there will be increasing conflict and confrontation between the two until the final big trouble, the great tribulation. But when that great trouble is described in the book of Revelation, there is a special section, the first half of chapter 7, which says God will protect the Jewish people during that bad time because he wants to meet them when he returns. Christians will die by the thousand. The book of Revelation is a manual for martyrdom. But the Jews will be protected. And so when they look on him whom they pierced, and when they see us with him, then we become one people of God. The two chosen peoples become one chosen people, one flock under one shepherd, and in his name take the world over. That places a terrible responsibility on us. We are getting ready to take over the world government. The Messiah wants to be able to say to a man, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of ten cities. He wants to say that. We will be in control of the media, the banks, the courts. My, we can't even run the church properly now. And we're going to be running the world with Jesus. But fortunately, when we see him, we shall be like him. And our salvation will be complete. And we'll be able to handle it with him. I must press on even further than this in the closing moments of tonight. Even that era of a thousand years of peace and prosperity with world government set in Jerusalem, with the son of David on the throne of Israel and the throne of the whole world. Even all that is not the climax. It's the penultimate. The ultimate is a new Jerusalem. Now you can't find that in the Old Testament. You can find the new heavens and the new earth in the 66th chapter of Isaiah, but not a new Jerusalem. It's still the old one. But Abraham knew about it. And Abraham was content at the age of 75 to leave a brick house with central heating and upstairs bedrooms and running water in the house. I kid you not. There are photographs of Vera of the Chaldees that reveal the high standard of living that Abraham left at the age of 75 to live in a tent for the rest of his life. Those of you who found a nice bungalow down here by the sea to retire, just think of Abraham leaving that lovely home at 75 knowing he would never live in a house again, but just have a tent. You can see the kind of tent at the back. And it says he did it because he was looking for the city whose architect and builder is God. Reminds me of an old hymn, a tent or a cottage, what do I care? He's building a mansion for me over there. That's how they used to sing. Our castles in the air become bungalows by the sea. But there's a new Jerusalem. I once said in a, in a group of Christians, I'm dying to see the architecture. And somebody said, you will, David, you will. 
Some of you got that. It's late in the evening for a joke. But I'm fascinated with architecture. I went to Canberra and studied the architecture of that new city. I went to Brasilia and studied the architecture of that city. Actually, by a German Jew, it was designed, a man called Nehemiah of interest. But in both cases, they dammed up a stream so there was river, right, a river of water right through the middle of the city. Where did they get that idea from? Why, straight from the new Jerusalem. Somehow, the old Jerusalem lacks a river through the middle. But the new Jerusalem is going to have it. And I wonder how God will overcome the basic problem of designing a huge city, which is how to give it human scale. That's the biggest problem architects have with their skyscrapers and tower blocks. They destroy the human scale. They don't make it feel like home. But I know that the New Jerusalem, huge though it is, will feel home. It's so big that it would only fit inside the moon if the moon were hollow. In terms that you more readily relate to, it would stretch from Paris to Warsaw in three directions. The New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. So the old Jerusalem is not the final focus of our hope for the future. Maybe for the next thousand years or more. But beyond that, we look for a new city that comes down out of heaven to earth. I would just like to show you one thing about that city that will kindle your imagination. It is going to be built of the most incredible materials, stones that leave the golden limestone of Jerusalem behind. Stones that we call precious because we only see them in small amounts. Some of them you will see on the high priest's breastplate. I see one over there. These are the stones that represent the people of God. And here is the interesting thing that was only discovered 20 years ago, but which is absolute proof that the Bible is the inspired word of God. 20 years ago, we began to be able to make pure light by putting light through polarized filters or by laser beams. Instead of the rays of light going in every direction and reflected off different surfaces, coming at us from all angles, pure light was made possible. And precious stones were cut into very thin wafers and cross-polarized light, forget the scientific terms, was passed through these wafer-thin precious stones. And suddenly we realized that of all the precious stones in the world, there are two different kinds. And one kind, in pure light, turns into all the colors of the rainbow, no matter what color it was when it began, whether it were red, blue, or green. It turns into all the colors of the rainbow. Here's a little picture of a tiny speck of jasper in pure light. It turns into all the colors of the rainbow. Scientifically, it's called anisotropic. Well, you can forget that. The other precious stones are called isotropic because in pure light, they turn black. They look like a piece of coal dust. Now, I've got some bad news for some of you ladies. Diamonds in pure light and nothing. Rubies lose all their color. Garnets lose all their color. Now here is the amazing thing. The 12 precious stones representing the people of God in the New Jerusalem and from which the New Jerusalem is constructed are all anisotropic. There they are, the 12 top stones. And at the bottom, you've got diamonds and rubies and garnets. So don't take your jewels with you, some of you. Well, you can't anyway. Now here is the amazing thing. How did John the Apostle know this when he wrote the book of Revelation? How could he have chosen the stones which were discovered to have this property just a decade or two ago? The answer is very simple. God knew because he made them. And he has chosen the most precious materials that we know to build his city. And it comes down out of heaven to earth. And here is the most astonishing thing of all. At the end of our Bible, it says that we don't go to heaven to be with God forever. God comes to earth to be with us forever. It's he who moves house at the very end. He was here at the beginning. 
Adam heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And it was in the old Jerusalem that he set his name and deigned to dwell in the tabernacle and then the temple, which you can see in models at the back. But God took the curtains down when Jesus died because that's what you do when a house becomes empty. You take the curtains down and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. God no longer dwells in a temple and in the new Jerusalem there will be no temple but God will be there. That's why the angel in astonishment says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with men. And this time he will not be hidden behind a gorgeous veil in a holy of holies with no windows. It says we shall see his face. And I find myself wondering what will God's face look like? And then I say, I think I know. It'll be just like his son's face because his son was just like his father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And this is what we look forward to in the new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem without a temple. The Jerusalem that will be a holy city because everybody in it will be holy. And nothing unclean or impure will pollute that city. And it is for that city that we are preparing right now. Amen.